It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life's Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Growing up autistic, today's guest, Jude Morrow, faced immense challenges. Once a nonverbal and aggressive child, he transitioned into a hardworking, responsible father to a non-autistic son. According to Jude, those with autism can have difficulty understanding the world around them and can find it hard to find their voice. But Jude found his and he uses it to break down the misconceptions and societal beliefs surrounding autism. Jude views his autism as a gift to be shared, not a burden to be pitied, and he teaches that autistic people's lives can be every bit as happy and fulfilling as those not on the spectrum. Jude is a social worker, motivational speaker, and advocate for all things autism. His new book is, Why Does Daddy Always Look So Sad? Welcome, Jude. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for uh, having me on the show, Joan. I'm... uh... Very happy with the warm introduction you gave me. Thank you. (laughs) Well, that is your life. And let's start there. Let's begin by talking about your life, your childhood. You describe yourself as a nonverbal and aggressive child. What are your memories from that time of your life? It was just a very lonely existence because from as far back as I can remember, I knew it wasn't quite like everybody else. I could sit back and look at other children play and have fun and interact with each other. And they were things that I found extremely difficult to do. I did go to a couple of playgroups whenever I was young and a couple didn't meet my needs. And before I went to school, mainstream school, I was at a playgroup for uh, mixed abilities. And I I I thought I fit in very well at that group, but it was just a very lonely existence for nearly all of my early childhood and and even teenage years because not only did I feel different, is that I hated the fact that I was so different to everybody else and I almost thought, you know, why can't I be like them? So it was very difficult to experience. Jude, when were you diagnosed with autism and what was the diagnosis? I was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome in 2001 whenever I was 11. That was just before I went on to secondary school. And what impact did it have on your family? Well, a diagnosis, like every autistic child in the world and parent, is that a, a, a diagnosis of autism only serves to do one thing in most cases, and that is to tell parents what they already know, because I've never met any parent in any of my live shows or book signings or anything that has believed their child to be autistic and been wrong, so I was very much the same. I I wasn't actually told of the diagnosis at the time because my parents didn't really want the the label to be put on me. But I always knew that I was different and it was something that I would just have to live with. And the diagnosis meant that I got some additional assistance through my secondary school years in the form of a classroom assistant or some additional help in certain classes that I struggled with. What's interesting, and I, I would love for you to try to explain this further to our audience, you keep saying that you knew something was different. And and I think that oftentimes people don't think that someone who is diagnosed with autism understands that he or she is different. So can you explain what that is like for us? And do most autistic people know that there's something different about them? Absolutely. I would say that is a universal feature. But people who are autistic are often cast aside and people would believe that we don't understand, which is completely false because I knew I wasn't quite like everybody else. And that's something that I had to deal with. I didn't just drift through life aimlessly, not knowing that I was different to everyone else. And Mm -hmm. I think the sad thing is, is that whenever people hear of the word autism, people automatically go to the intellectual disability mindset where perhaps autistic people don't understand. I know that uh, autistic people can have learning disabilities as well but in my case that isn't true and I mean I I don't think that I was very consulted I don't think a lot of people reached for my feelings people just thought about me he doesn't understand it doesn't really matter Mm -hmm. in some cases which was quite hard to go through and since I've been speaking to more autistic people in recent times that a lot of people have had the same experience and the same existence which is which is quite sad. 
So, dude, you had some educational challenges, but yet you progressed through secondary school and graduated from college. How were you able to make that transition? What was your life like and, and what did you do to be able to get through that? Well, I would love to say that it was all my sheer goodwill, determination and mindset, but that wasn't Mm -hmm. necessarily true. I had the best uh, backroom staff and entourage that anybody could hope for, and my mum and dad, sister Emily, my classroom assistant teachers, and even a couple of friends that I'd made. I didn't go to like an autism specific group whenever I was young. Those things didn't really exist in the early 2000s, but I went to a youth group so that I could meet new people and make friends and It was there that I realized that I was quite good at doing funding applications on behalf of the group and solving problems. And when I was 18, I was asked back to that group to be a youth leader. And it was from there that I had wanted to pursue a career in social work. And that's what I've been doing since 2012. So, you know, we're talking about autism in relationship to you and your life, but there are so many different types of challenges that people experience. And when you're going through those difficult times, often you don't see a future for yourself. You don't think you're going to be able to accomplish what other people do. So what do you say to someone who may be autistic or going through any type of challenge to help him or her believe in their future? Well, the first thing that I would say is if you have a passion or a drive or a talent, nurture that talent and use it for yourself. Because one of my real loves in life was was reading and writing. And it was always a bit of a bucket list thing for me that I wanted to have a book written by the time I was 30. And I did that whenever I wrote White is Tad, I always look so sad. But no matter what it is, whether it's photography, uh, chess, building things, nurture that talent and use it because that may be one day what makes your living and I don't think that your talent or your special interest should be suppressed by anyone because whether it's in school or even in second and third level education there seems to be uh, an onus on autistic people to fit in with everyone else whenever autistic people have been shown to be bright courageous and creative people. So if those talents were suppressed from the likes of Einstein, Mozart or Stanley Kubrick or Michelangelo, the arts and humanity may not be the same as what what it would be now. What would you say to a parent who has an autistic child, they just received this diagnosis, what do you say to that parent that he or she can take in to be able to better help their child? Well, the first thing that I would I would say is to seek out local voluntary and charitable groups. A diagnosis only has one practical application, which would be a periodic medical review, whether it's three months, six months or annually. But if you have an autistic child, look at the services and groups in your area because it'll serve to do two things. The first thing will be it'll allow your autistic child to meet other autistic children like them. That was an opportunity that I didn't have and that I would love to have had. Perhaps I wouldn't have grown up feeling so lonely in the world and that I was the only one. And for parents, it would allow them to meet parents in the same position as them because whenever I was very young, my mother had a very lonely existence too because a lot of the time I didn't want to go outside. The routine was pretty much uh, constructed by myself and my my mother had to follow it and i suppose whenever she kept whenever i went up in the years and she started talking to more people she got more advice and and guidance from from other parents as well so that uh, is probably the most useful thing that i can say reach out to local groups sign up and a lot of the time you don't even need a diagnosis for those things whether it's in the states or europe or even here any any group that i have spoken to I have always asked them, do you need a diagnosis to join your group? And always the answer is no, simply because it's a global issue that waiting lists and uh, diagnostic timetables can be anywhere from three to five years. And what is the process for getting a diagnosis? I know someone who she is just certain that her daughter is on the spectrum, but she can't get the diagnosis. And without that, she can't get the services she needs. So what is the process? Well, it does vary. Uh, I, I mean, in the United States and here, the healthcare systems are, are vastly different with here. We have the NHS, and I know that in the, the U.S. it's more of an insurance-based system. Mm-hmm. But even if she reaches out to a local charitable group and explains that situation to say, look, 
we're waiting on a diagnosis. I believe my child is autistic and I would bet everything I have that she is not wrong because I've never met a parent that has thought mm, I believe my child to be autistic and been wrong, as I mm-hmm. said. Mm-hmm. But I, I would strongly recommend that she reaches out to her own local charitable groups and explains that, look, we're waiting on a diagnosis. The first uh, port of call really is your general practitioner uh, who will make the onward referrals to psychology or childhood psychiatry to make that diagnosis. But a lot of parents, uh, like the, the person you know, are in the same position where it's just waiting lists and waiting lists and waiting lists. And even in the United States, no matter how premium your health care coverage is, even for psychiatry, waiting lists are still very, very long. So a lot of charitable uh, groups do understand that and will often offer some assistance and support and services, even if a formal diagnosis isn't exactly made just yet. You're a parent now. You have a son. What has that journey been like for you? (laughs) Well, Ethan is my best friend. He is just a whirlwind of happiness. He's seven now. And we get on like a house on fire. We're two peas in a pod. He's not <laughs> autistic. He's not. He's he's not like he's not like me. So it's nice to have a little intimate view into his universe. And likewise, I, I allow him into mine. And it wasn't always easy because whenever I had graduated from university, I was a social worker. I had a driving license, a car. I had my own space. And in my head, being autistic was something that affected me in childhood. And I had left that behind because I'm now over six feet tall and have a beard. Surely I can't be autistic anymore. <laughs> so when, it, when whenever I learned that Ethan was coming along, mm-hmm. I was plagued by doubt, as, as is a lot of first-time parents. But being autistic, I think I maybe felt it slightly more acutely than what most fathers would. And the constant ever-changing landscape of fatherhood really started to affect me because by nature I'm quite a regimented and routine reliant person and I mean with babies babies don't exactly work like clockwork do they they wake up at different times need changed at different times like different foods different things and over time these things started to affect me to the point where I just felt completely out of touch and not in control of my own life And I suppose whenever I was a young man, whenever I was 24, 25, I still felt a lot of resentment uh, for my childhood because I just felt it was just one challenge uh, after another. I never fit in anywhere. And those things really stayed with me, even growing up. And it came to be that whenever Ethan was three, my struggles were so apparent that Ethan actually asked my own mother, why does daddy always look so sad? And that's what became the title of the book. And it was whenever my three-year-old son could see so clearly that I was struggling, that mm-hmm. I knew I needed to come to terms with being autistic and, and accept myself for who I am. So Jude, how did you manage that? How did you, for someone who uh, it was important to have repetition and routine, and that was your sense of normalcy, how were you able to overcome that? Well, um, the the answer sort of comes in uh, in two parts. The the, fir- the first part is the kind of unhealthy part, uh, mm-hmm. which is that what I decided to do to kind of ease my anxieties was to take up a hobby. And I know a lot of people would take up relaxing, calming hobbies like meditation, flower arranging, baking a cake even. But I decided to set myself the lofty goal of running a marathon. So I went out running morning and a night after work and ran the hills and the valleys and became almost obsessed with it with, with running I had taken up exercise and whilst I did feel the physical benefits of it like uh, I lost weight I felt much better about myself but on the other side of it really I was literally running away running away from the problem which was getting closer to Ethan and forging that good relationship with him and accepting myself for who I was. And it was only after I'd completed the marathon with an injured hip because I just did not want to give up. Uh, I was turning up on the day. I was running the race that I'd realized that I pretty much missed a year of my son's life because I didn't want to face the fact that I was autistic and that he could see it. And it was then that I had finally accepted the help that I had been offered for so many years in the form of 
uh, psychotherapy, counselling and cognitive behavioural therapy. And through those things, I had to change my lens on life of how I look back at things. Because up to that point, I'd look back at my life as nothing but strife and challenges and being cast aside by society. But really, when I look back on it now, having undergone these therapies, is that my life has really been one victory after another, Mm -hmm. getting through school, getting through university, becoming a dad, forging a career. And, you know, I now view my life and childhood with pride as opposed to self-loathing, pity and hatred. And you know, gee, that's a lesson for everyone because we tend to look at limitations or things we can't do. But I love what you said, that when you view your life, it's been one victory after another. And that's what we all should be doing. Oh, it, it has been because I just thought that no matter, I was focusing more on the barriers that were being thrown in my path as opposed to emphatically and in style jumping over them and running beyond them. And that's, uh, I think... In psychology, uh, as I learned whenever I was going through my social work degree, is that we humans seem to have a terrible negative bias. And I suppose it's like a survival instinct, that that, that worry, that self-doubt, because it's what stopped primitive man being mauled by mammoths and bears whenever uh, we lived in caves and trees. And I suppose what we can do is overcome that in time to view ourselves more positively, become more... Uh, productive and be proud of who we are and I I don't think that message is strictly for autistic people I think that can relate to many many more people Mm -hmm. the book is why does daddy always look so sad if you'd like to get more information about Jude and his work you can visit judemorrow.com or as always you can visit our website cyacyl.com which stands for change your attitude change your life Jude in our final moments What do you want us to know about autism and how would you like to see society change their views on autism? I would love for autistic people to be included in every conversation in wider society. The autistic view is formed by parents and medical professionals and really most of autistic literature is non-autistic people telling autistic people like me what autism is not. So I would encourage everyone to listen to autistic voices as much as possible and that being autistic is not a death sentence. It's For me, it has been the driving force behind all of my victories and success in life, whether it's from becoming a social worker, selling out speaking tours, selling books, and even speaking, uh, speaking with you. I mean, it's a positive thing. And, and without autistic people in the world, I just don't think the world would be as nice a place and that autism is simply a different neurotype and that autistic people shouldn't be brought into line like like everyone else and that every difference, no matter what it may be, whether it be race or gender or sexuality or neurotype, whatever it may be, is that everybody should be celebrated on, on their own merit and not stigmatized because they're not like the majority. Jude, thank you so much for spending this time with us and for sharing your story and your message. And thank you for having me on the show. Thank you. This is Conversations with Joan. Until next time, thanks for tuning in.